I'm Jonathan Brunt, the government editor of the Spokesman Review. Today, we are here with candidate for attorney general, Nick Brown, a Democrat, and also here to help uh, uh, interview Mr. Brown is Ellen Dennis, our Olympia reporter. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Can uh, You served as the U.S. attorney for Western Washington. I'd like you to talk a little bit about your background and what stands out as why you think you're qualified for this role. Sure. No, absolutely. And thank you again for having this uh, conversation. I grew up in Washington, in Pierce County. Both my parents were military veterans and public servants. And so I grew up right outside of JBLM, Fort Lewis, when I was a kid and uh, left here and followed my parents' lead into the Army, went off to college in Atlanta, Georgia on an Army ROTC scholarship to pay for undergrad, and then law school, and then started my legal career as an Army JAG lawyer. So I served all over the country, all over the world as a, as a JAG, helping soldiers and families in the beginning with family law and consumer protection matters, and then became a criminal lawyer, both working as a defense lawyer representing soldiers in court, and then eventually as a prosecutor in the Army. I spent a whole year deployed in 2005, uh, supporting troops over there as a lawyer, then came back here and finished up at Fort Lewis. Then I joined the Department of Justice as an assistant U.S. attorney, where I worked on complex criminal cases, both fraud and violent crime matters, and then joined Governor Inslee during his first term as his general counsel, so his lawyer and got to work on a myriad of law and policy issues with the governor's team, with the AG's team, and really saw firsthand how important that role is. And it really started to spark my interest on being the attorney general one day because it's so important for a myriad of reasons. Um, I then joined a private law firm in Seattle that does mostly public sector litigation, representing governments and nonprofits, and then was appointed, uh, as you note, by President Biden to be the United States attorney here in Western Washington, where I got to lead a large public law firm focused on how do we keep people safe and how do we address uh, gun crime, fentanyl crisis, discrimination, uh, just a myriad of responsibilities that I really enjoyed, but ultimately decided to step down because I do think the role of the AG is just so vitally important for a host of different reasons. And I do think it's my background as a lawyer and advocate. It's been pretty broad, both private practice and criminal work on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and my experience as a leader and uh, being able to run the attorney general's office because it's a huge agency. A lot of people don't know there's about 800 lawyers in that office with 13 offices across the state. And so it's a big management task and I'm excited to take it on. I just really think it's important and it follows my path of doing public service. So I'm excited about it. So uh, Mr. Ferguson has run the office for 12 years now or almost 12 years. What would you do differently than what Mr. Ferguson does and or has done. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to build upon. And I think A.G. Ferguson and his team should get a lot of credit for a lot of positive things uh, that people are both aware about and some things that we don't talk about enough from my perspective. Obviously, there's lots of attention around the national litigation and particularly um, when President Trump was still president, those lawsuits. But there's a myriad of other things that I think Bob and his team have done incredibly well. I'll highlight a couple of things that I'd like to build upon. Uh, one, you know, they created a civil rights division that did not exist 12 years ago, and they've been able to take on some pretty important cases, making sure that our public facilities are discrimination free and if people's civil rights are getting violated, the state is their advocate. He also created an environmental enforcement division that didn't exist 12 years ago to make sure that we're holding polluters accountable. And that work needs to continue because their threats to our climate and our environment are still very uh, prominent. Bob and I are very different people. We have different backgrounds. Most of my background is in public sector criminal justice matters. um, And I think I'd like to bring more attention and focus on how do we use that office to facilitate public safety here on a myriad of different ways. There's some new things I'd like to do in the office. Um, One of my ideas, and we put it out on our our webpage for the campaign a few months ago, was to create a new division around uh, labor and worker protection issues, because I do think there's a really important advocacy that the AG's office can do to make sure we're addressing things like wage theft and worker safety issues. So there's things that would be different, but I do think there's a real positive uh, foundation for the next attorney general to build upon. Okay. Ellen, do you have a question you'd like to ask? Yeah. Um, Nick, on the campaign trail, you've discussed um, a want for more transparency in the attorney general's office. Could you discuss that? Well, I think all of government needs to be more transparent. Um, Washington state has very robust public records laws. I think it's one of the things that builds uh, trust and faith in government. We've obviously seen not only in Washington, but across the country, 
uh, increased distrust of government and government actors. There's lots of reasons for that. But I think that the ways that you can uh, alleviate that problem or at least mitigate some of that challenge is by being more transparent and making sure that people have access to the office and explaining your decisions um, as best as you can. So that's both in the public records context, um, that's in our actual litigation cases to make sure that we're being uh, as open as possible. Obviously, there are some protections that come with uh, legal work and casework and protecting your clients. But I think that across state government, including the AG's office, we need to continue to innovate AG's office has a particular unique role because it provides uh, guidance to local jurisdictions as well that look to the AG's office for help around implementing the Public Records Act, best practices, and I'd like to see that work continue. And you know, there's a constant need to do improvements about how we provide public records and innovate and use our technology. So I think there's a wealth of, of improvement we can do in that office and across all of government. Okay. Uh, been a lot of focus this campaign cycle about crime and higher levels of crime since the pandemic and violent crime and so forth. Um, do you have any proposals specific about crime, fighting crime, um, prosecuting crime, that kind of thing? Yeah, well, a few different things. And you know, this is something we probably could spend the whole time talking about. Um, as I said earlier, bo- most of my background as a lawyer, as an advocate for people, is around public safety issues. And all across the state, no matter where I go, people are concerned about it. And I think with good reason, there are certain types of crime that is up in the last few years. Uh, But I also think we should be transparent about the fact that in many areas, crime is down and certain types of crime are down. And um, we need to be sure that we're addressing the right kinds of problem when we talk about crime trends. There's also increased poverty that we see, more homelessness, more open drug use across the state. Sometimes um, that is criminal activity. Sometimes it is not. And so we need to be very clear about diagnosing the types of problems that we're, we're talking about. And as much as people think about the attorney general as the chief law enforcement officer for the state, within the office, there's not that much direct criminal casework. There's a very small subset, but most of that work happens at the local level. So there are a few different things that I think we need to continue to do and, and new innovations that we should think about. First and foremost, we have seen violent crime go up and mostly from firearm violence. And the AG's office has con- has been a leader, and I want to continue the work around defending Washington's gun safety laws. We are one of the better states in continuing to innovate around that area. Guns and firearms and, and laws around that is obviously something that it can be very political and divide people. But I do think the laws that we've passed have saved lives. And you know, the area that I look to with the most hope and hope and optimism is actually around suicide death. Um, you know, during the pandemic. Suicide rates went up all across the country, except in Washington. We actually went down. We went from having a top 10 suicide per capita rate to down closer to the 20s. Part of the reason that we were able to do that is because we have gun safety measures, uh, like extreme risk protection orders that temporarily remove firearms from people that might be a threat to themselves or others. We have things like safe storage requirements that slows down the incidence of suicide attempts. Those are things that have saved lives. And suicides is something that most people are one or two degree separation from, either a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, whomever. And the, the laws that we've passed have saved lives. I think that's just not debatable. And so continuing that work, both on the policy perspective, but more important from the AG's perspective, to continue to innovate um, and defend our gun safety laws is gonna be very important moving forward as the legislature looks for new approaches. But also, when I think about public safety, I mean, we need to do a few different things. We need to continue to hold people that cause harm accountable, and uh, that's law enforcement and and prosecution support. And I think the AG's office should try to be a resource for local jurisdictions where they need it. But from my vantage point, having done this work for a couple decades now, all of those are very temporary solutions. And, you know, 97 percent or so of the people in Washington state prisons will one day get out. And we need to be thinking about what are all the things that we can do to prevent them from going into prison in the first place, or when they get out, how can they re-enter society more successfully? And from my vantage point, those are all the things that have nothing to do with police or jails. That's housing, um, which is obviously a crisis across the state. And so the AG's office should be using its office to advocate for more housing across the state. That's things like a public education system that gives people opportunity an, ed- an economic system that gives people jobs and keeps them employed. And, and all those things are what make safety sustainable. And in, tho- in those underlying things, including you know supporting and improving our mental health system, those are all things where the AG does both casework and policy work. And I want to continue that work because I do think that that is what ultimately will make us safe. 
Uh, the Attorney General Ferguson has lobbied the legislature a lot on gun laws and uh, has had some success in that arena. Are there particular things that you would like to see changed in law that uh, related to the firearms that you would push for? I think the single best policy change that we could do is a permit to purchase, purchase law. This is something that Oregon has recently passed. It's been defended thus far as being constitutional, and it is the single uh, biggest correlation between increased public safety and firearm violence is to have a pit permit to purchase law. Washington has yet to adopt such a policy. That is something that I would love to see the state do. Obviously, there are multiple variations of that, and so we need to make sure that we develop that in a legally defensible way. But it, to me, seems very common sense. I mean, we have to have a permit to drive a vehicle, to operate heavy equipment. Um, but for the most part, you don't need that with a very deadly weapon. What and would you say, what would be required to get a permit under what you would propose? Well, I, I would I would turn to the legislature to develop the policy. Um, you know, the AG's job is first and foremost just to do the legal work, not to be a policymaker. And I do think this is really important because the AG is not a legislator. Um, we can advance policies, you know, do AG request legislation. But I would look to the model in Oregon and see if there's if that's the model we want to uh, adopt as well, or if there are different changes that we want to make unique to specific here. But I do think the general concept of a permit to purchase law is a very positive one and something that we should look at very closely. Do you think that Attorney General Ferguson has been too active in the legislating? No, I don't. Arena? No, okay. no I, I fully support it. Um, I think he's done some really important work. He's got a really strong policy team. The AGs have done this historically, um, and I think he's led in a lot of important ways. Uh, but the, you know, when I'm talking about new policy, I want to make sure that we go to the folks that are actually implementing those laws and look to them to help write the bills, and the AG can be a resource in that. Okay. Ellen? Continuing on the topic of public safety, do you think there need to be more cops in the state? Yes, I do. Um, I think Washington State, it's fairly widely known that we have the lowest per capita there. Um, I think we need law enforcement increases in many jurisdictions in the state. The reason for that is that it allows for a more robust public safety network and uh, shorter response times when people are dialing 911 or have other emergencies. It allows for more community policing and community uh, police officers have the opportunity to understand their communities very closely, to build relationships, to be a more trusted partner, to participate in things with community groups that are foundational for public safety. Excuse me, those are all things that require more officers than we currently have now. I don't know if that's true in every municipality and every city across the state, but I think as a statewide uh, policy, it would be better to have more officers than we do now. Okay. And with that increased number of police officers, if elected, how would you balance that with calls for police reform um, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and other black people around the country? Well, yeah, and the murder of so many uh, black and brown people, indigenous people, people living in poverty, more police officers doesn't necessarily mean more safety. And I, I, I think as much as I support having more officers, it is not the be all to end all to these, to these issues. And we need more accountability and um, accountability builds trust. And you know, having worked very closely with law enforcement throughout my career, they also wanna make sure that they're operating as, as best as possible. And we cannot do that unless we have uh, officers who are held accountable when they do harm. We've given them great responsibility. We should have a lot of faith in the work that they do. Um, but if they make a mistake and if they violate somebody's uh, constitutional rights or their civil rights or they outward commit a crime, they need to be held accountable like anybody else. There are a lot of different ways that we can do that. You know, the state passed and implemented a couple years ago the Office of Independent Investigation around law enforcement uh, uses of force. There have been bills contemplated in the last couple of years to create a new Office of Independent Prosecution, which is something that I support. I think it'd be a great uh, way to continue to build that transparency and accountability. And we need to make sure that we continue to invest in their training and their own resources. And we send people off to the CJTC, the Criminal Justice Training Center. We need to make sure that the best practices that they're training there around de-escalation and dealing with people in crisis and all those things are not skills that they lose when they go to their home jurisdictions and they become more seasoned. So everything that we can do to continue to improve their training will help them you know, mitigate the harm that they, they might cause. And But accountability is a big part of it. And we've continued to try to use our laws to prosecute people who have committed uh, wrongs. And those are something that I definitely support. And you know, in my conversations with law enforcement, there's obviously 
a lot of tough conversations that need to be had. But they don't want to see officers who are committing the law also just continue to serve and continue to be you know, operating like nothing was done wrong. So I think this is something we can actually agree upon. There's a lot of devil in the details, but I certainly think we need that accountability to build safety across the state. Speaking of uh, details on that, um, you know, legislature a few years ago passed some stricter uh, policies on policing, on when to initiate a chases, um, on you know uh, warrants, on on a lot of different areas, and uh, some of those have been rolled back. Did you agree with those policies when they were approved, and did you agree with the rolling them back? Or well, you put a lot of policies under that right. umbrella, yeah. so I don't so want to. So you can you can talk about specifics and break it up. Yeah. So you know the state and the country, I think correctly, was dealing with a really. Uh, a time of turmoil, a time of mistrust, a lot of public attention and protest uh, for good reasons. Um, we have repeatedly seen throughout our history, but in recent times, acts of police misconduct, uh, downright violence, uh, again, against principally communities of color and impoverished communities. And when those go unchecked and we continue to operate like the status quo, then that um, distrust forments and gets worse. And so I applaud the legislature for trying to take a very close look at these policies and see how we can mitigate harm. Um, there's obviously lots of bills that with sort of fell into that umbrella that you framed around uh, police chases, around use of force policies. Um, there were you know, a myriad of other changes in that, into that a bucket of, of policy changes. I think reform is always positive. The way that we need to make sure that we do it, however, is to make sure that we involve all of the stakeholders and involve them substantively. Um, that means law enforcement officers, that means their organizations that represent them, and it means the community. My biggest problem, frankly, in the, in the way that the legislature approaches in the last few years is that a lot of the bills they wrote were really hard to understand, uh, did not do robust stakeholder engagement. And the end product caused a lot of confusion. And you know, to me, the, one of the biggest examples of that is that after the legislature passed the original police pursuit bill and some of the um, use of force policy, members of the legislature themselves subsequently submitted requests for AG opinion to the attorney general's office asking what the law meant, which is not the way it should work. It should work. We all understand what the law is going to mean, particularly when you're going to make big, massive changes. Um, around the police pursuit policy specifically, I was glad to see them uh, ad adopt the initiative, and this the terminology gets here important, but adopt the initiative that was being proposed to the legislature, which rolled it back sort of to where it began, but not, not quite. I think they need to go back and continue to see if we can reform and make improvements. Um, we want people that have caused harm uh, to the public or present a threat to the public. We want police to pursue those people, but we don't also want a law enforcement off offer them uh, chasing recklessly and causing harm. Uh, there were some articles this week about some chases where people ended up harmed, if not killed. And that's uh, a real reality is the more they chase, the more harm gets done to innocent bystanders. But I supported what the initiative or what the legislature did this, this session with the initiative. Are there other ones that you think need to be rolled back further? Uh, not off the top of my, my head. Um, you know, it's the AG's office to continue to look at these areas. Um, the way we think about public justice matters now is dramatically different than it was 20 years ago. Um, and I don't think it, we should be afraid to take a close look at, at criminal justice policies, sentencing policies, policing practices, because this is a different state, a different country than it was uh, 20 years ago. And we, need, we think about crime and criminality different now because of data, because of science, um, because of how culture has changed. And so as a state, change is good. Reform is good. This is what we do with all of our areas, and we shouldn't treat criminal justice any differently. You, you mentioned then wanting to have more police. What about prosecutors and public defenders? Well, I would start with the defenders, frankly. Um, and this is not new or unique to Washington, but public defenders are historically underfunded and under-resourced across this state, uh, across this country. Um, as I said, I started my career as an Army version of a public defender. I was in the Army, an active duty officer, and assigned to represent people who had committed crimes or alleged to committed crimes. I know the power of government, and I know the impact of government and police and how those rights can be violated. And so I think the resources for defense lawyers is really important. 
because that really just makes prosecutors do their job. And if we get a conviction and that person who was accused of a crime had a very robust defense, then we should have a lot more trust and faith in that defense. If that defense lawyer has 100 other cases on their caseload and they've only had you know an hour or two with their client, that to me foments uh, distrust for, for good reason. And so we need to fund that. A lot of that funding comes from the local level. Our criminal justice budgets are the biggest portion of county uh, budgets most often, both jail and, and the prosecution process. So more funding for that is going to be necessary. Not every jurisdiction necessarily needs the same sort of resources. And so I don't wanna make a blanket statement about every place needing more prosecutors. But I certainly think that across the state, what I've seen is data supporting that we need more public defenders to make sure that our justice system is operating uh, trust in a trustworthy way. Ellen, do you have a question? Yeah. On the campaign trail, you've discussed some issues you have with the current Attorney General Bob Ferguson and the way his office has handled discovery in legal cases. Could you talk a little bit about that and how you would work to change that if you're elected? Yeah, and I, I, I guess I'll push back a little bit. I don't know if I've spoken about that as a, as a widespread problem or a systemic problem in that office. Uh, I know you and I talked about it during our interview. Uh, they had a couple of very specific cases where they had some discovery problems that led to some fines uh, on behalf of the state, and that was a serious error in those cases. Um, I don't have any real insight that that's a larger systemic problem, but I do think as a, as a lifelong um, lawyer and not lifelong, as a professional lawyer and someone who's worked on both sides, we want to make sure that our staff in the AG's office is high, having the highest standards around discovery and transparency. And um, we never want to have a case where we have failed to provide documents to the other side where that they were legally entitled to. And so continuing to improve the professionalism of that office is going to be a, a real goal of mine. Um, I know that they've made some changes since they had those uh, two specific cases that I'm aware of, and I will continue to bring my own viewpoint about ways that we can improve that work. Um, because you know, having worked for the Department of Justice for a very long time, I think that that's something that we always prided ourselves on, and that helps resolve problems more quickly at lower taxpayer expense as well. So that's gonna be an area where we continue to try to make big improvements. You brought up- okay. oh. Do you have a follow-up? Um, oh, no, you can go, okay. Jonathan. Um, early on, you mentioned fentanyl. And I'm wondering, what can the attorney general's office do to help stem that crisis? You know, it's interesting because no matter where I travel in the state, fentanyl is one of the top four or five issues that people talk about. And, you know, I'm, I'm on the west side. I grew up in Tacoma area. I live in Seattle. Certainly, it's top of mind for a lot of people there. But even when I travel to Eastern Washington or very small communities on either side of the state, it is something that a lot of people are, are worried about as well. And for good reason. And, you know, I saw something a couple months ago that shed, that showed that Washington and Oregon are the top two states for overdose deaths in the country per capita, which is a tremendous problem. And we cannot continue to think about the drug crisis in sort of the old terms that we have because fentanyl is particularly unique. It is unique because of how cheap it is. Uh, it's very easy to mass produce because it's a largely a synthetic and it is impacting our kids more than anybody else. And every state officer, including the AG, needs to take this problem very, very seriously. There is not one magic button that we can push here to address this crisis, um, but I think it is a combination of very robust enforcement. A lot of that is going to be in the federal government or the Department of Justice um, because Drugs, fentanyl is coming from every corner and every avenue possible. It's coming across our border, it's coming in through our mail, it's coming in through our airport, it's coming in through our ports. And we need to do everything we can to stop that. Even if we do all of that, however, we're only gonna stop a fraction of the drugs um, because there is much more demand and much more opportunity for import than all the resources that we could devote to it. And so the idea that we can only do one thing to solve this, it's just not honest. We need to do that because that I think those interdictions do save lives, but we also need to do things that address people's drug addictions and root cause problems. And that is an area where the AG's office, I, can, I think, can continue to assist with. Um, there is specific um, casework around improving our drug court systems, our mental health systems, um, all the things that might contribute, contribute to someone who's dealing with a drug addiction. There are things that the AG's office can do just as a convener and a collaborator to bring people together to try to help solve these problems. 
that is actually, I think, a really important part of the work is to use the opportunity that of that office to bring the stakeholders together and figure out where the AG's office can be a resource. Maybe that's doing direct casework with local county jurisdictions, and we can do that if they request or the governor requests. So there might be some specific casework. It might be just how do we improve the local drug uh, counseling systems and resources, um, because those are really where when people are dealing with problems, they're generally going to come to local government first and not the state government. So I want to make sure that the AG's office is accessible um, and doing the casework and doing the convening in every way possible and being a, a partner with the federal government around enforcement. And certainly having been the U.S. attorney, I know how important those state and local relationships are, and I want to make sure that we continue that work and, and improve it. What do you feel about possession penalties? Um, you know, uh, as a result of a state Supreme Court case, legislature changed that, made it a lot more lenient. Uh, they've gone back a little bit on that. Oregon decriminalized. They've come back and turned around. What, what's your position on um, jail time or prison time for possession? Well, you, you're often not going to get um, prison time for possession unless it's an amount that's distributable. And, and just to clarity, prison means more than a year. Jail means less than a year. So felony versus misdemeanor. Um, I do think it's important to have that tool available for people, um, for people to have real penalties if they're possessing. Um, but I want to be very clear: I, we're not going to incarcerate our way out of these problems. Uh, you know, certainly, if someone is possessing a personal use amount, and we arrest them, we throw them in jail. They get out, you know, within a month or two or what have you. They're still going to have their underlying drug addiction problem, most likely. They're not going to recover, uh, most likely, while they're in prison. And so that is not the solution. Um, but we see people who are possessing and causing harm to others often. And in our public spaces where that sort of open drug use or uh, possession actually makes the community less safe. And so I think we need to have that tool of, of punishment because I've seen that work in very positive ways as well. The reason that we have successful drug courts, both at the state and federal level, is because we have judges who can hold them accountable for um, for failing to abide by court conditions. And so if you don't have that hammer, sometimes you don't, you're not going to have the success. And so I don't support decriminalizing across the board. I know Oregon tried it, although, you know, there's real question about whether they actually fully invested in the um, drug addiction part of that, because they, at least from my vantage point, <laughs> really did not. Um, and I know there have been efforts to introduce decriminalization across the state in Washington. I don't support that. I don't think it's the right approach. Uh, and we're certainly not there yet, if, even if we did think that was the right approach, because we don't have the underlying resources to make that work. Ellen. A f yes. A follow-up on that. Um, with people who are accused of crimes and spend time in jail, um, I've seen that there is a backlog. I know it varies county by county, but sometimes folks are spending time months or even years behind bars before their case goes to trial. And if they can't afford to post bond or um, anything, um, or if they have a public defender, it takes longer. Um, what would you do if elected to address those backlogs? And would you call for any change to state law to kind of figure out that crisis? Well, I definitely think that state should be uh, as robust of a partner as it can be in helping local governments deal with those backlogs. Um, because those backlogs have multiple impacts. They not only impact the people that are pending adjudication of their sentences, their family members, alleged victims who want to see people held accountable and have some redress in the courts, but it impacts the entire system. It impacts the, all the civil cases that people are waiting on to adjudicate because criminal cases take precedent um, for good reason. But when we have those backlogs, uh, it causes a real disruption and breakdown across the board. Um, and so, you know, the state and fed, excuse me, state and local governments share some of the funding responsibilities, both for judges and local resources. Um, and I know the state government or the local governments would love to have more support from the state. I'd love to see ways to use the office, the AG's office to be a resource if local jurisdictions need help. Obviously, that puts a funding burden on the AG's office, and we'd have to fund that through the legislature as well. But I do think it makes sense for the AG to be a partner for local jurisdictions. Maybe there's a certain category of cases or a, a particular jurisdiction that could use resources in a crisis point. I'd like to see us do that. 
And we need to continue to use our court systems or think about ways that we can innovate in our court systems and expedite procedures. And we've seen some of that on the micro level because of COVID, because we use more Zoom proceedings. Um, Certainly in the civil context, we do that all the time now. We don't travel for depositions most often. We can do court proceedings via Zoom. That makes it more accessible for people, uh, particularly for people that are lower income and the idea that they would have to travel significant distances and take time off of work to be a hearing. And so I think the AG should be an advocate for that and see if there's best practices that we can adopt across the state uh, and share that practice with the with all the local governments. Um, but I, you know, I, I want to make sure that we're not just doing the status quo wherever we go and we're looking at other jurisdictions and looking outside of Washington to see if there are ways that they've been able to successfully address their backlogs. Right. Alan, do you have any last question? Yeah. What sets you apart from your opponents in this race? Well, I, I do think there are really big differences between me and, and the Republican running, um, both in experience and priorities and ideas for the office. Um, and so I could spend a lot of time talking about those. Um, I actually currently have a case against him. Um, I'm, I still work. I'm still a, a, in private practice. I represent the Alliance for Gun Responsibility. We help the AG's office uh, defend Washington's gun safety laws, and the Republican in this race is on the other side of those cases trying to invalidate the assault weapons ban in Washington, which I think is just um, a vital, life-saving law that was passed here in Washington. But for both him and the other Democrat in the race, what I think makes me unique is some of the things that I've touched upon uh, earlier. In my experience as a lawyer and advocate for people, I have a very broad legal background. I've done both sides of the aisle as a criminal lawyer. I've done complex civil cases. I've argued in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and been in the Supreme Court. These are all things that I don't think either of my opponents have done. And, you know, they've got their own backgrounds and can talk about their qualifications. But I think just purely in legal experience, I will be able to, to hit the ground running and really understand all of the types of cases that are happening in that office because I've also served as a special assistant attorney general, I do now, in a number of cases. Maybe more important than all that is the next attorney general is gonna have a huge leadership responsibility. As I mentioned, it's a giant office. It's the largest law firm in the state with a total of about 1,600 employees and the budget in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Having been the US attorney, I know what it's like to lead a large public law firm because I've done it. I had a staff of about 150 people, a $15 million budget, with jurisdiction for half the state of Washington and worked really collaboratively with my staff, with law enforcement, with the community, with the main Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. That is an experience that uh, I think really prepares me to be the next attorney general. But for me, that was the the cusp of uh, a really a long career of leadership. Way back when I started my career as an Army lawyer, one of the very first responsibilities I had was running a free Army income tax center where we help soldiers and their families prepare their tax returns because they couldn't afford it otherwise. And I was fresh out of law school, a second lieutenant in the Army, and I had a staff of 15 members, and I had to train them. I was responsible for their management, their oversight, their evaluations, and that was the beginning of a, of a succession of leadership careers to go from there, to go from the governor's office to be the lawyer for the governor and his team, and all the way to being U.S. attorney. That is a leadership experience that I don't think anybody in this race has. I think it's what makes me unique because the challenges that the attorney general is going to have are going to start January 2025. And we need somebody that can hit the ground running and knows the law and knows how to lead. And I think that's me. Mr. Brown, I appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you.